Elaine Fleischman, start at the beginning. Um, why mm -hmm. did you decide to come forward, and how did you end up at Chase? Sure. Um, for a long time, I was expecting it to come out. I've been talking to the government for two and a half years now, and first it went through the SEC, then it went through the civil division of the DOJ. And at some stage, after watching all of these major banks have deals that actually the facts get wiped away, I started to feel that if I don't come forward, there's a real chance of that happening here, too. Uh, in terms of J.P. Morgan Chase, I started there in March 2006, at sort of the height of, of the boom. Um, when I started, everything seemed normal. I didn't really realize some of the things that were happening in the background. Um, and then things started to change in about May, a couple months after I'd been there. Well, what, when you went to work there, what specifically was your job? And if you could walk us through uh, how you began to realize the, the huge problem that the bank was a part of. Sure. I started as what they call a deal manager. Um, basically, we coordinate between all these different groups when we're bringing in these loans that are then going to be sold to investors. Um, I first noticed that there was a problem when they brought in a new person to do our diligence, which is just the review of the loans themselves to make sure they're of good quality. Um, as soon as he came in, we suddenly this wall sort of came down between myself and the group that was doing this review, and you couldn't get information that you would normally get. On top of that, there was immediately a sort of a no email policy. Uh, he wouldn't send emails, and we weren't allowed to send him, him emails. He would actually come out and yell at you if you sent him an email. Well, what was the reason? Uh, it was never given, uh, which was extremely worrisome, because normally the reason why you have a compliance and diligence department is to actually have written policies about what you're doing to be able to explain to people how you're making your decisions. So it's exactly the opposite of what you would normally expect. And when you say to review the quality of the loans, if you could, sure. for people who are not aware, yes. you were in essence uh, certifying that these individual loans could be packaged into a group of securities to be then be sold to uh, investors uh, in, a, uh, in a huge package, right? But you had to go through every individual loan? Was that? Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much what happens. It's really that you're taking the actual loan files that was done between the the lender and the and the borrower, and looking at them to make sure everything looks right. Does this person have enough money to pay off their loan? Do they have the sort of history where we think that they're going to pay this loan? And if we find that they don't, then we're actually not supposed to purchase the loans, and certainly shouldn't be selling them to other investors without at least telling them there's something wrong with them. And so what was the smoking gun for you? Um, everything about what really started happening in particular became apparent in, in October <coughs> was that sometimes we had deals coming in where even though I wasn't even the person looking at the loans, you could tell from where I was that something was wrong with them. Uh, the, the Greenpoint deal, which is what Matt talks about in his article, even when the loans came in, they were very, very old, which usually you try to actually pool these loans and sell them within two to three months. These loans were going back to close to the beginning of the year. If you work in the industry, you know immediately what that means is either they couldn't sell them because the buyers were telling them they weren't any good, or even worse, they'd been sold and then had missed a bunch of payments, so they'd actually been sold back to the originator any of those loans you wouldn't normally sell to investors as regular loans. Now, Matt, you've re referred in your article to these loans as basically selling old, beat-up used cars as if they were new. Could you exp explain that? Yeah, that's exactly what Elaine is talking about. Essentially, what the, the bank was doing was there, you know, there, were, there, are, there are companies out there, these mortgage lenders, like um, you know, a company that might be familiar to people is like Countrywide. Uh, in this case, it was a, an originator called Greenpoint. They would go out into neighborhoods, and during this boom period, they were giving mortgages to anybody and everybody with a pulse, essentially. They were uh, especially low-income neighborhoods. They were offering these very um, um, advantageous loans to people, whether they could afford the houses or not. They were buying huge masses of these loans, and then they were like liars' loans or stated income, where no one even checked whether the person had the income to That's actually exactly pay it right. off. That's exactly right. The, that was the verbiage: liars' loans. The FBI warned that there was going to be an epidemic of these liars' loans way back in 2004. The industry ignored these warnings. The government ignored these warnings, um, and there was this huge influx of these stated income loans where people um, uh, could just say that they made an enormous amount of money and nobody would check. Um, so the bank buys all these loans, and then what they were doing is 
essentially throwing them into big pools, making hamburger out of them, and then selling that hamburger to pension funds, um, uh, insurance co companies, hedge funds, all kinds of investors, typically ordinary people were the, were the people on the other end buying this stuff. They were investing in these securities, and often they didn't even know it. Mm -hmm.